BestBookBits.com presents the book summary of Becoming Supernatural by Dr. Joe Dispenza. Harnessing scientific research and drawing from ancient wisdom, Becoming Supernatural explains how the average person can free themselves from self-imposed limitations and transcend their lives. The author, Joe Dispenza, is a doctor and educator specializing in the fields of neuroscience, epigenetics, and quantum physics. Becoming Supernatural Summary, Book Notes. In the opening section, Dr. Joe Dispenza describes what it means to become supernatural. Readers are presented with the story of a woman named Anna, who, after the sudden demise of her husband, developed serious health conditions, but who eventually was able to heal herself. From a scientific standpoint, living in stress is living in survival. When we perceive a stressful circumstance that threatens us in some way, a primitive nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system turns on and the body mobilizes an enormous amount of energy in response to the stressor. When this happens psychologically, the body is automatically tapping into resources it will need to deal with the current danger. In Anna's case, the stressful news of her husband's suicide threw her brain and body into a state of survival. All of us are built for dealing with short-term bursts of stress. When the event is over, the body normally returns to balance within hours increasing its energy levels and restoring its vital resources. But when the stress doesn't end within hours, the body never returns to balance. In truth, no organism in nature can endure living in emergency mode for extended periods of time. Because of our large brains, human beings are capable of thinking about their problems, reliving past events, or even forecasting future worst-case situations, and thus turning on the cascade of stress chemicals by thought alone. We can knock our brains and bodies out of our normal psychology just by thinking about an all-too-familiar past or trying to control an unpredictable future. Every day, Anna relived that event over and over in her mind. What she didn't realize was that her body did not know the difference between the original event that created the stress response and the memory of the event, which created the same emotions as the real-life experience all over again. Anna was producing the same chemistry in her brain and body as if the event were actually happening again and again. Emotions are the chemical consequences of past experiences. As our senses record incoming information from the environment, clusters of neurons organize into networks. When they freeze into a pattern, the brain makes a chemical that is then sent throughout the body. That chemical is called an emotion. We remember events better when we can remember how they feel. The stronger the emotional quotient from any given event, either good or bad, the stronger will be the change in our internal chemistry. When we notice a significant change inside of us, the brain pays attention to whoever or whatever is causing the change outside of us. And it takes a snapshot of the outer experience. That's called a memory. Therefore, the memory of an event can become branded neurologically in the brain. And that scene becomes frozen in time in our gray matter, just as it did for Anna. The combination of various people or objects at a particular time and place from that stressful experience is etched into our neural architecture as a holographic image. That's how we create a long-term memory. When we experience a traumatic event, we tend to think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience, and we tend to feel chemically within the boundaries of the emotions from the event. So our entire state of being, how we think and how we feel, becomes biologically stuck in the past. When the fight or flight nervous system is switched on and stays on because of chronic stress, the body utilizes all its energy reserves to deal with the constant threat it perceives from the outer environment. Therefore, the body has no energy left in its inner environment for growth and repair, compromising the immune system. So because of her repeated inner conflict, Anna's immune system was attacking her body, She had finally physically manifested the pain and suffering she'd emotionally experienced in her mind. In short, Anna could not move her body because she wasn't moving forward in her life. She was stuck in her past. So if Anna was turning the stress response on by thinking about her problems and her past, her thoughts were making her sick. And since stress hormones are so powerful, she had become addicted to her own thoughts that were making her feel so bad. On that cold winter's day in February 2011, when Anna was on the floor crying for help, she made a choice with a firm intention to change herself and her life. 
and the amplitude of that decision carried a level of energy that caused her body to respond to her mind. It was as if that moment redefined her. She knew she had to start all over. Anna was now more committed to believing in a new future than believing in her same familiar past. She used her medications, combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion to change her state of being from biologically living in the same past to living in a new future. More on clear intention and elevated emotions later. She did this by going within and changing her unconscious thoughts, automatic habits, and reflective emotional states, which had become hardwired in her brain and emotionally conditioned in her body. By doing the meditations, Anna learned that she could teach her body emotionally what her future would feel like ahead of the actual experience. Her body as the unconscious mind did not know the difference between the real event and the one she was imagining and emotionally embracing. She fully understood that if the stress chemicals that have been coursing through her body had been turning on unhealthy genes, then by fully embracing those elevated emotions with a passion greater than the stressful emotions, she could turn on new genes and change her health. Furthermore, she learned that genes don't create disease. Instead, the environment signals the gene to create disease. Anna understood that if her emotions were the chemical consequence of experience in her environment, and if she lived every day by the same emotions from her past, she was selecting and instructing the same genes that might be causing her poor health conditions. If she could instead embody the emotions of her future life by embracing those emotions before the experience actually happened, she could change her genetic expression and actually change her body to be biologically aligned with her new future. Over time, she could see that her thought patterns had changed. She was no longer firing the same circuits in her brain in the same way. So those circuits stopped wiring together and started pruning apart. As a result, she stopped thinking in the same old ways. Emotionally, she began to feel glimpses of gratitude and pleasure for the first time in years. She had connected to a field of information called the quantum field, where all possibilities exist. Anna had become a new person, a new person who was healthy. The disease existed in the old personality. By thinking, acting, and feeling differently, Anna reinvented a new self. In a sense, she had become reborn in the same life. Healing all sorts of physical conditions may be a very impressive benefit of doing this work, but it's not the only one. Because this book is also about the mystical, I want to open your mind to a realm of reality that will be just as transformative as healing, but that works on a deeper and different level. Becoming supernatural can also involve embracing a greater awareness of yourself and who you are in this world. Let's take a closer look at what happens biochemically inside your body when you think a thought or feel an emotion. When you think a thought or have a memory, a biochemical reaction begins in your brain, causing the brain to release certain chemical signals. That's how immaterial thoughts literally become matter. They become chemical messengers. These chemical signals make your body feel exactly the way you were just thinking. Once you notice you are feeling a particular way, then you generate more thoughts equal to how you're feeling, and then you release more chemicals from your brain to make you feel the way you've been thinking. For example, if you have a fearful thought, you start to feel fear. The moment you feel fear, the emotion influences you to think more fearful thoughts, and those thoughts trigger the release of even more chemicals in the brain and body that make you continue to feel more fear. The next thing you know, you get caught in a loop where your thinking creates feelings and your feelings creates thinking. If thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain and feelings are the vocabulary of the body and the cycle of how you think and feel become your state of being, then your entire state of being is in the past. When you fire and wire the same circuits in your brain over and over again because you keep thinking the same thoughts, you are hardwiring your brain into the same patterns. As a result, your brain becomes an artifact of your past thinking and in time, it becomes easier to automatically think in the same ways. The moment you wake up in the morning and search for the familiar feeling called you, you start in your day in the past. So when you start to think about your problems, those problems, which are connected to the memories of past experiences of different people or things at certain times and places, create familiar feelings such as unhappiness, 
fertility, sadness, pain, grief, anxiety, worry, frustration, unworthiness, or guilt. We could say that your mind and body are in the known, the same predictable future based on what you did in the same familiar past. And in that known, certain future, there's no room for the unknown. Living in the program, predictable timeline for your known reality. You'll see there's a line in the middle called the now. On the left, you have yesterday, and on the right, you have tomorrow. Yesterday is the automatic program, and tomorrow is the automatic program. Beyond that, tomorrow is the unknown event. What you want to do is go below the line of now and look at the present moment, which is always now. You have the past on your left and the future on your right. The unknown is unfamiliar, uncertain, but it's also exciting because it occurs in ways you cannot expect or anticipate. So let me ask you, how much room in your routine, predictable life, do you have for the unknown? If you can predict the feelings of any experience, you are still in the known. For instance, the thought of having a meeting with the same team of people you have worked with for years can automatically cause you to call up on the emotion of what that future event will feel like. When you can predict the feelings of that future event, because you've had enough past experiences to make it known to you, you're probably going to be creating more of the same. Think of emotions as energy in motion. Think of emotions as energy in motion. When someone experiencing a strong emotion walks into a room, their energy is often very palatable. We often all felt another person's energy and intent when they were angry or very frustrated. We felt it because they were emitting a strong signal of energy that carried specific information. All those energies can be sensed and felt. As you might expect, different emotions produce different frequencies. The frequencies of creative, elevated emotions like love, joy, and gratitude are much higher than the emotions of stress, such as fear and anger, but they carry different levels of conscious intent and energy. The only way to change our lives is to change our energy to change the electromagnetic field we are constantly broadcasting. In other words, to change our state of being, we have to change how we think and how we feel. If where you place your attention is where you place your energy, then the moment you place your attention on a familiar emotion, your attention and your energy are in the past. If those familiar emotions are connected to a memory of some past event involving a person or an object at a particular place and time, then your attention and your energy are in the past as well. As a consequence, you are siphoning your energy out to the present moment into your past. By the same means, if you start to think about all the people you have to see, the things you have to do, and the places you have to go at certain times in your routine day, you are siphoning your attention and energy into a predictable known future. So let me ask you this, could it ever be possible for your body to start following your mind to the unknown? If so, can you see that you would have to change where you put your attention? And that would lead to changing your energy, which would require you to change how you think and how you feel long enough for something new to happen. While it may sound incredible, this is indeed possible. It makes sense that just as your body has been following your mind to every known experience in your life, if you were to start investing your attention and energy into the unknown, your body would then be able to follow your mind into the unknown a new experience in your future. If you focus your attention on specific imagery in your mind and become very present with a sequence of repeated thoughts and feelings, your brain and body will not know the difference between what is occurring in the outer world and what is happening in your inner world. So when you're fully engaged and focused, the inner world of imagination will appear as an outer world experience and your biology will change accordingly. That means you can make your brain and body look as if a physical experience has already happened without having the actual experience. What you put your attention on and mentally rehearse over and over again not only becomes who you are from a biological perspective, it also determines your future. Here's a good example. A team of Harvard researchers took a group of volunteers who had never before played the piano and divided the group in one half. One half practice a simple five-finger piano exercise for two hours a day over a period of five days. And the remaining half did the same thing, but just by imagining they were sitting at the piano without physically moving their fingers in any way. 
The before and after brain scan showed that both groups created a dramatic number of new neural circuits and new neurological programming in the region of their brains that controls finger movements, even though one group did so by thought alone. Similar studies showed that the same kind of results with muscle training. In a pioneering study at the Cleveland Clinic, 10 research subjects between the ages of 20 and 35 imagined flexing one of their biceps as hard as they could in five training sessions a week for 12 weeks. Every other week, the researchers recorded the subjects' electrical brain activity during their sessions and measured their muscle strength. By the end of the study, the subjects had increased their bicep strength by 13.5%, even though they hadn't actually been using their muscles at all. They maintained this gain for three months after the training session stopped. When you change your emotions, you can change the expression of your genes, turning some on and others off, because you are sending a new chemical signal to your DNA, which can then instruct your genes to make different proteins. If your immune system has been subject to living in the emotions of stress for too long, and has certain genes activated for inflammation and disease, you can turn on new genes for growth and repair and switch off old genes responsible for disease. Something as simple as moving into an elevated state of joy, love, inspiration, or gratitude for 5 or 10 minutes a day can produce significant epigenetic changes in your health and body. When you wake up in the morning and immediately start putting your attention and energy on all the people you have to see that day, the places you have to go, the objects you own, and the things you have to do in the three-dimensional world, your energy becomes fractured. All your creative energy is flowing away from you. When your attention and therefore your energy is divided between all these outer world objects, people, problems and issues, there's no energy left for you to put on your inner world of thoughts and feelings. This begs the question, how much of your creative energy is tied up in guilt, hatred, resentment, lack or fear? The truth is that you could be using all that energy to recreate a new destiny. To do that, you're going to have to get beyond all of the things in your outer world by taking your attention off them. That's why we use meditation as the model to change our internal state. Use meditation as the model to change your internal state. This allows us to break from our associations to everybody, everyone, everything, everywhere, and every time long enough to journey within. Dr. Joe Dispenza takes the reader through a meditation exercise. He also provides some tips for the beginner. So let's say you're sitting in your meditation and you start to have some stray thoughts. You're in the habit of thinking that way because you've been thinking the same way and putting your attention on the same people and things at the same time and place for years now. The instant you notice what's happening, that you are putting all your attention on that emotion, you become aware that you're investing your energy in the past because emotions are records of the past. So you stop and return to the present moment and begin to disinvest your attention and energy out of the past. Every time you keep settling your body back to the present moment, like training a dog to sit, you are reconditioning your body to a new mind. Each time you become aware of your program and you labor for the present moment, you are stating that your will is greater than your program. And if you keep returning your attention, and therefore your energy, back to the present moment, and you keep noticing when you are present and when you are not, Sooner or later, your body is going to surrender. It is this process of continuously returning to the present moment every time you become aware that you're lost in that begins to break the energetic bonds with your familiar known reality. And when you do return to the present moment, what you're actually doing is getting beyond your physical world identity and unfolding into the quantum field. The quantum or unified field is an invisible field of energy and information or you could say a field of intelligence or consciousness that exists beyond space and time. Nothing physical or material exists there. It's beyond anything you can perceive with your senses. This unified field of energy and information is what governs all the laws of nature. Think of the quantum field as being filled with infinite amounts of energy vibrating beyond the physical world of matter and beyond our senses. Invisible waves of energy available for us to use in creation. What exactly can we create with all this energy swimming in an infinite sea of potentials? That's up to us because in short, the quantum field is the state in which all possibilities exist. 
When you walk through the door to a quantum field, you can't enter as a somebody. You have to enter as a nobody, as only an awareness or a consciousness, a thought or a possibility, leaving behind everything else in the physical world and living only in the present moment. This process requires that you break your chemical addiction, at least temporarily, to the same emotions that used to drive your thoughts, and you stop feeling the same way so you can stop putting your attention on the three-dimensional world of matter, the particle, and instead put your attention on the energy or possibility, the wave. Given all of that, you probably won't be surprised to learn that such an experience creates some pretty significant changes in your brain. First, because you are perceiving yourself as being beyond the physical world, which means there's no outside danger to anticipate, your thinking brain, the neurocortex, the seat of your conscious mind, slows down, becomes less aroused, and works in a more holistic fashion. The different compartments that were once subdivided now start to unify and move toward a coherent, whole brain state. Different neural communities reach out and form bigger communities. They synchronize, organize, and integrate. And what sinks in the brain begins to link in the brain. Once your brain gets coherent, you get coherent. In other words, once you start connecting to the unified field as an awareness, or once you become more aware of it by paying attention to it, your biology becomes more whole and unified. Since the unified field is by definition a unifying energy. When brain waves are coherent, they are in a phase with one another. Both their crest, their high points, and their thoughts, their low points match. Because coherent brain waves are more orderly, they are also more powerful. You could say they speak the same language, follow the same rhythm, dance to the same beat, and share the same frequencies, so they find it easy to communicate. They're literally on the same wavelength. When brain waves are incoherent, on the other hand, the electrochemical messages or signals they send into different parts of the brain and body are mixed and is erratic, so the body cannot then operate in a balanced, optimal state. The second change our brains experience when we enter the quantum is that our brain waves move in a slower frequency, from beta brain waves to coherent alpha and theta brain waves. That's important because as we slow down our brain waves, our consciousness moves out of the thinking neurocortex and into the midbrain, the limbic brain, and there it connects with the automatic nervous system, the body's subconscious operating system. In other words, when you are in the present moment, you can get out of your own way. As you become pure consciousness, pure awareness, and change your brain waves from beta to alpha and even to theta, the automatic nervous system, which knows how to heal your body much better than your conscious mind does, steps in and finally has an opportunity to clean house. That's what creates brain coherence. Once you're in the sweet spot of the generous present moment, where all possibilities exist in the quantum field, how do you turn one or more of those potentials, those immaterial possibilities, into reality in the three-dimensional world of matter? This requires two things, a clear intention and elevated emotion. Your clear intention is exactly what it sounds like. You have to get clear on what it is you want to create, getting as specific as possible and describe it in detail. Let's say you want to go on a great vacation. Where is it you want to go? How do you want to get there? Who do you want to go with or who do you want to meet when you're there? What do you want to do or see when you're there? You get the point? Make it detailed. Make it as real as you can. Now you have to combine that intention with an elevated emotion, such as love, gratitude, inspiration, joy, excitement, awe, or wonder, to name just a few examples. You have to tap into the feelings you anticipate you will have when you manifest your intent and then feel the emotion ahead of that experience. The elevated emotion, which carries a higher energy, is the magnetic charge you are sending out into the field. And as you read, when you combine the electrical charge, your intention, with the magnetic charge, elevated the motion, you create an electromagnetic signature that is equal to your state of being. I want to back this up a bit to emphasize how important elevated emotions are for this equation to work. After all, when you decide to observe a future in the quantum field that you want to manifest, if you're doing it as a victim or as someone who's suffering or feeling limited or unhappy, 
Your energy is not going to be consistent with your intended creation and you won't be able to call that new future to yourself. That's the past. You may have a clear intention and therefore your mind may be in the future because you can imagine what you want. But if you feel any of those familiar limited emotions, your body still believes it's in the same limited past experiences. Elevated emotions carry a higher frequency than survival emotions. So if you want to create change, you have to do it from a level of energy that's greater than guilt, greater than pain, greater than fear, greater than anger, greater than shame, and greater than unworthiness. Therefore, if you're going to perform something that's unlimited, you better feel unlimited. If you want to create freedom, you better feel free. And if you want to truly heal yourself, you better raise your energy to wholeness. The more elevated the emotions you feel, the greater the energy you broadcast and the more influence you will have on the material world of matter. And the greater your energy, the shorter amount of time it takes for your manifestation to appear in your life. But you must remain aware because the moment you forget and start stressing about what is going to happen or how it's going to happen, you'll return back to your old self trying to predict the future based on the past. And then you'll start feeling the same old familiar emotions with the same lower energy that influence your same old thoughts and you've just made the choice to stay trapped in the known. We could say that you'll disconnect from the energy of your future the moment you feel the familiar energy of the emotions of your past. And if you do it often enough and you do it correctly, you'll change your biology from a past present reality to a future present reality. That is, you will change your brain neurologically from being a record of the past to becoming a map to the future. At the same time, as you teach your body emotionally what the future feels like in the present moment, you'll recondition your body with this new elevated emotion. You'll be able to signal new genes in new ways, and you'll change your body to look like the future you choose with your clear intention has already happened. That means you begin to biologically wear your future. In Becoming Supernatural, Dr. Joe Dispenza clarifies how to form a clear intention as well as experiencing elevated emotions. Here's a brief summary. Think of some specific refinements of what you want and list at least four of them. The only thing I don't want you to consider including is any mention of a time frame. For example, if your intention is a great job, your list might look like this. Making $50,000 a year more than I'm making now. Managing my own team of awesome professionals. Traveling all over the world on a generous expense account. Making a difference in the world. Now on that same piece of paper, write down the emotions you will feel when that imagined potential happens. You might write empowerment, unlimited, grateful, love with life, joyful, or worthy. Whatever it is for you, write it down. And if you think you won't know how it's going to feel because you haven't experienced it yet, then try gratitude. That works really well. Gratitude is a powerful emotion to use for manifesting because normally we feel grateful after we receive something. So that emotional signature of gratitude means it has already happened. When you are thankful or feel appreciation, you are in the unlimited state to receive. When you embrace gratitude, your body, as the unconscious mind, will begin to believe it is in that future reality in the present moment. These various emotions you just listed are the energy that is going to carry your intent. This is not an intellectual process. It's a visceral one. You have to really feel those emotions. You have to teach your body emotionally what that future is going to feel like before it happens. And you have to do that in the present moment. The author walks the reader through a meditation called Tuning In to the New Potentials. At the beginning of the meditation, in the last chapter, I ask you to reset your attention in different parts of your body as well as in the space around different parts of it now. Now I want to dive deeper into why I ask you to do that in almost all my meditations. When you practice this, you sharpen your ability to master two different ways your brain can focus, using convergent focus and divergent focus. Convergent focus is a single-minded or narrow focus on an object, anything having matter. It's the same kind of focus you use when you pay attention to objects in your environment. Typically, when you go to pick up a glass, call or text somebody, or tie your shoe, you use narrow focus. However, when you change your attention from using narrow focus to adopting a more open and broad focus, 
as you will do in this meditation, you can become aware of the space and so the light and the energy around your body is space. This is called a divergent focus. You go from focusing on something to focusing on no thing, on the wave energy, instead of the particle matter. Reality is both the particle and the wave. It's both matter and energy. So when you practice using narrow focus to reset your attention in different parts of the body, acknowledging the particle, and then you open your focus so that you sense the space around these parts of your body in space, acknowledging the wave, your brain changes into a more coherent, balanced state. In the 1970s, Les Fimai, PhD, director of the Princeton Biofeedback Center in Princeton, New Jersey, discovered how this shift in attention from narrow to open focus changes brainwaves. Fermi, a pioneer in attention and biofeedback, was trying to find a method for teaching people how to move their brainwaves from beta, conscious thought, to alpha, relaxed and creative. The most effective way to make the shift he discovered was by directing people to become aware of space or nothingness, adopting what he called open focus. The Buddhist tradition has been using this method of meditation for thousands of years. As you open your focus and sense information instead of matter, your brain waves slow down from beta to alpha. This makes sense because when you're sensing and feeling, you're not thinking. One of the main purposes of meditation is to move beyond the analytical mind. What separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. As you slow your brain waves down, you move out of your conscious mind and thinking brain past the analytical mind into the operating system of the subconscious mind where all those automatic programs and unconscious habits exist. We're about to take a closer look at each of the body's energy centers. But first I want to explain a bit more about how they work. Think of each of them as an individual center of information. Each has its own specific energy and carries a corresponding level of consciousness, its own emission of light expressing very specific information, or its own frequency carrying a certain message. Looking at the energy centers, the pituitary plexus, the pituitary gland, the pineal plexus, the pineal gland, the thyroid plexus, the thyroid gland, the heart plexus, the thymus gland, the solar celiac plexus, the adrenal gland, superior mesocentric plexus, the digestive and pancreatic glands, and the inferior mesocentric plexus, the sexual glands. The lower three energy centers of the body are connected with survival. They're about using power, aggression, force, or competition so we can survive the conditions in our environment long enough to consume food to nourish ourselves and then procreate and keep the species going. Nature has made these lower three centers very pleasurable so that we keep engaging the actions related to them and what they represent. Having sex, first center, and eating, second center, are quite enjoyable as it is connecting and communicating with others, also the second center. Personal power, third center, can be intoxicating, including the success of overwhelming obstacles, getting what we want, competing against others, and winning, surviving in a particular environment, and pushing ourselves to move our bodies around. Our bodies are surrounded by invisible fields of electromagnetic energy that are always carrying a conscious intention or directive. When we activate each of the body's seven energy centers, we could say we are expressing energy out of those centers. Simply put, when we as conscious beings activate a specific energy in each individual center, we stimulate the associated neurological plexus to produce a level of mind that when activates the proper glands, tissues, hormones, and chemicals in each center. Once each unique center is turned on, the body emits energy carrying specific information or intention from it. These are the notes from the first five chapters where Dr. Joe Dispenser shares the key insights which are the foundational to his teachings. The book consists of 14 chapters. Afterward, every time we change our state of being and begin our day by opening our hearts to the elevated states that connect us to a love for life, a joy for existence, the inspiration to be alive, a state of gratitude that our future has already happened, and a level of kindness towards others, we must carry, maintain, and demonstrate that energy of state of being throughout the day, whether we are sitting, standing, walking, or lying down. 
And that's a wrap on the best book bits I found from Becoming Supernatural by Joe Dispenza. If you like this summary and want to listen to over 500 more, check us out on Spotify, Google Podcast, and Apple Podcast. If you're into the video book summary, check us out on YouTube, where you'll find over 500 video book summaries where you can watch at your pleasure. If you're into the written book summary, check us out at bestbookbits.com, where you'll find over 500 written book summaries where you can read at your pleasure. If you want to join a free book club, join the book club to access over 400 books by popping your details in the link below. Join the tribe, read more books, make new friends, get access to authors, become a part of a community of book lovers, a mastermind of readers, thinkers, and doers. If you want to be updated with the latest book summaries, pop your email in the link below to get the weekly newsletter. Thanks for watching and listening. Hope you got something out of this. Go out there and become supernatural. Take care. Bye-bye now.